Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing discussing every database is multimodal. What does this mean to an enterprise? Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. If you would like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the Q&A or the chat panel, you may find the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. To answer the most commonly asked question, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within a couple of business days containing the links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and we'll also send a link to the recording of this session as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce you to our speaker for this series, William McKnight. William is advert advice. <laughs> William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies for, from the Information Management Plan for Leading Companies in Numerous Industries. He is a prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. William is a leading global influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads McKnight Consulting Group, which is twice placed on the Incorporated 5000 list. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome, my friend. Hello, everyone. This is William. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I understand a lot of people are enjoying the uh, the, the lead-in music. Uh, it always cracks me up uh, that lyric where he he sings about going down to Austin or Ecuador because you know they're they're so close. Uh, they are <laughs> so of, close, right next. Yeah, to Yeah, I always think of them <laughs> as one or the other. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, you know, some uh, I've been have have had the opportunity recently to think a lot about the. Uh, the music industry for my musician friends and uh you know as it relates to ai and you know other music that might be royalty free or probably and probably shouldn't be royalty free is audio audio music you know music that we can all make by just just prompting uh so there is a lot of change going on in in that industry but we're here to make music of a different kind we are putting together the orchestra if you will to handle the data within our organization and there is a dynamic going on called multimodal. And by the way, I might say multimodal. I don't mean anything by one versus the other. I just kind of go back and forth uh, as the industry does right now. So multimodal, multimodal. And I wanted to bring to you some thoughts uh, about what this means to an enterprise. So we're gonna, going to talk about what that means, what some of these data types are that are part of this. Uh, what some of the players are doing in this. I'll give you some examples, some ways to think about it, and how to uh, how to look at the market and decide for yourself whether you want to do a multimodal approach and uh, what it means to an enterprise if you do it successfully. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and, well, first let's look at some of these logos. Now, these are logos that uh, we are associated with here at McKnight Consulting Group, but I couldn't help but notice that columns one and three have a lot of databases in them. Well, that's what we do, but we've seen a lot of these databases over the past few years go multimodal, whereas they may have started out in a certain with a certain data type specialty, they now handle multiple. And uh, I would say kind of most of these uh, are that way right now. The chances are yours is too chances are you are sitting on a multimodal database in your organization, and chances are you're not utilizing its multimodal capabilities. Well, maybe that'll change after today as I expose some of those capabilities to you and uh, maybe get you thinking in some different ways that might simplify your environment, reduce your TCO, and improve the opportunities uh, for your organization. Well, here we are, the uh, midpoint of the year. Can you believe it? Every database is multimodal. That's our topic this month. Uh, the prior ones are mostly, if not all, available now on YouTube, as well as here at dataversity.net. And I look forward to the ones for the remainder of the year. Next month, I'll be talking about master data management 
How do you think about ROI with master data management? All the things that, that we're dealing with uh, out there in the field. So I really enjoy bringing this information to you. All right, decisions, decisions, decisions. Trying to stay ahead of all the decisions that we have to make, architecting our environment, improving the analytics, getting us into AI, and for some of us, uh, optimizing the AI within our environments. Because, and you'll hear me say this, You perhaps you've heard me say this, and I'm gonna to start to nuance it, but uh, there is no real one size fits all. Yes, we can, there is no one database, data warehouse that is in the sky that all of our data goes to um, in any organization. Just hasn't worked out that way. And so here we are. And when I do my consulting to organizations, we don't spend a lot of time digging back into history. Why'd we do this? Why'd we do it that do it that way? We just go forward. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Acknowledge where you are. And that means sometimes a cold, hard look in the mirror at your environment and uh, what it's become, the good and the bad. It's got you here. And hopefully there's still a, a great path forward to uh, improved uh, 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 opportunity for you, improved opportunity for your organization. I'm pretty sure there is. So let's look for that. Now, there's a lot of different types of uh, databases that have gone multimodal. And keep in mind that I am talking about multimodal either for a, a single application or, or I should say and for an architectural standard, meaning you reach for that database most all the time. So yeah, Oracle, for example, is multimodal, and I'll use them as an example throughout. So you can reach in, reach for Oracle for just about anything, um, and there are a lot of data types that it now supports that it didn't use to, and you may not be aware of that. So you may or may not have to go for this, go for that, and uh, get a bunch of different databases in anymore. Well, we'll see. We'll see as we go along here. You might be platforming a single application. That's right, a single application. That might be your concern, that's fine. And both of, both of these concerns though were kind of covered by this presentation. So uh, just know that if you're in one camp or the other, there is that other camp in your enterprise. And we got to be thinking about both of them because there are many data types. There are many data types in an organization in order to make an enterprise of pretty much mid-size and up run these days, you've got to deal with all this data. Open link data, JSON, XML, everything you see there. And these are all supported by specialized databases. As a matter of fact, for most of you, you have specialized databases for some of these data types. Uh, what, what of these types might you not be familiar with? Well, log files, okay, log files, they are they are so foundational to big data when, when you have them. They, they are actions that have occurred. So for example, web servers maintain these files listing every request made to the server. And with log file analysis tools, it's possible to get a good idea of where the visitors are coming from and how often they return and how they navigate the site. Um, so I'm going to come back though in a few minutes on the most popular of these, because I want, want, you, want to be sure that you're well aware of what those data types are. Now, there's a growing complexity as the data types have expanded within our enterprise over the past few years. And this complexity results in silos and fragmentation, results in limited skills, or maybe I should say highly specialized skills, uh, which may not be applicable wide, you know, in a wide sense within the organization, and also concerns about scalability uh, within the organization. These problems only mount as, as the data size mounts. Yes, data scales, and you, but you still you have to do many things with data as it scales. It's not just let it run. You, we want it to, but uh, that's not reality. So there are challenges of scalability and performance with the traditional approaches as data volumes increase. So how do we address these challenges? Well, there's a glimmer of hope out there in terms of simplification. Simplification is something that I drive hard towards uh, when I consult. Uh, I like things simple and it's hard to get there these days. It really is. Now, I went to DB Engines and I might quibble about some of the database models that they say 
that that these databases are. I might say, well, it's not necessarily good for this or that, but whatever, they have a list. I have a list too, but theirs is more comprehensive. So I'm using theirs as an independent list. And as you can see on their list, the top eight databases right now are multimodal, multimodal. 10 of the top 13 are multimodal. And I did the count 133 of the 415 or 32% of the total are multimodal. Now it dropped the the multi-model label drops off the deeper you get into the list, which makes sense, right? Because the less popular databases, they haven't they haven't um, turned the revenue yet to expand into multi-model. And so they're still specialized. And I'm not saying don't use specialized databases, right? Uh, but also kind of eye-opening is the fact that there are 404, 415 of these databases in operation. Um, and uh, I must say there's quite a few uh, I, I don't recognize, but they're out there. Um, so this is not a, a, a kind of niche thing going on. Uh, it's, it's, it's very popular and it's only going to get more popular as we, as we come back to sim something that is more simple. I kind of view it like it's an accordion out there. It's the accordion it expands as it has over the past years and years. And it continues to expand right now, by the way, in, in other areas, but it might be contracting a bit. We might be bringing that together uh, in this area of databases. So that's our glimmer of hope for simplification. Now, what are these major data types being consolidated into multimodal? Let's get into them. And first of all, why not just relational for everything? Well, relational is great for great alphanumeric data. Uh, it's great up to a certain scale. Um, it's great for organized data and getting random access. But to orchestrate, if you will, all data, we invented, not me, but you know, the industry, we invented NoSQL some years ago, maybe 20 years ago at this point. Uh, these databases have been around for that long, and they have historically for the vast majority, I would say, of their existence, specialized in a certain data type. And that was fine because we had that, we had those specialized needs. But what they're all about, all these NoSQL databases, these are databases that don't use, well, they didn't historically use SQL, I'll put it that way. And they give you more data model flexibility. Web services is your data model. You can you can load multiple. Uh, profiles of records uh, into such a database. There's no schema first approach. You don't have to lock in your columns. You just load the data, any data. And it relaxes ACID, which is great for operational purposes, transactional purposes, right? Atomicity, let me see if I remember these. Atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Incidentally, some multi-model databases ensure ACID guarantees across all data stores, um, you'll, you will find that these multi-model databases do have multiple data stores frequently to accommodate uh, the different data types. There are low upfront software and development costs, programmer freedoms, fault tolerant redundancy, and great linear scaling, which this wouldn't work if it did not have that kind of scaling. So that's why we got into NoSQL in the first place. So there are many ways that NoSQL designs solve problems more efficiently than traditional SQL and relational systems. Perhaps, well, one of the most common uh, NoSQL databases is the property graph, the property graph. And these are fun to play with, fun to be a part of. And these have nodes, which are the objects in the graph, like Dan, Ann, and the Volvo car here. These have relationships. Uh, between the nodes, yeah, it's a lot of fun. These are databases like Neo4j, Janus Graph, Tiger Graph, Amazon Neptune, OrientDB. These are this is the easiest of the graph models to work with. There are a couple that I'm going to share with you. A couple major ones, right? Um, yeah, let me finish blowing this out. As you can see, lots of relationships going on here. But if you scale your relationships big you might need a semantic graph, which is based on the resource description framework, 
which is a standard for data interchange on the web developed by W3C. And the data there is stored as a triple store, which is easy to remember, uh, easy to relate to, but it does make for a lot more records, uh, but it's pretty scalable, subject, predicate, and object. Subject being uh, a kind of a noun like, like William, I guess, predicate being some, some kind of verb like I like to, and the object being, well, what do I like? I like to run. Okay, William likes to run. That's subject, predicate, object. And the RDF triple store is just replete with records with that orientation. It's a structured knowledge representation. The target market is, one target market is users of third-party data in RDF. But largely, you can do anything with a semantic graph that you can do with the property graph. Uh, but it's a different language usually. The language is Sparkle, S-P-A-R-Q-L, and it has fairly equivalent functionality to the cipher language, which is what Neo4j uses. Actually, it uses more now, but that's the main language. Examples of this are Lego Graph, Onto Text Blaze, and OpenLink Virtuoso. And by the way, I am speaking of these databases as I give you these examples. What I mean is that these databases, this is their primary data type, or this is their historical data type. Most of the database examples I'm giving you have evolved into being multi-model, like some of these in the next category. There we go, vector embeddings. Yeah, well, hmm. I haven't seen anybody else put vector in NoSQL. Well, I'm doing it. Uh, because I feel like it meets all the criteria uh, for no for being in the NoSQL category. Last month, I gave the full hour on Vector, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, it is hot right now. Um, I'm all over these analyst days and things like that going on right now. And it's just Vector after Vector, Gen AI after Gen AI. So, you know, that's really hot right now. But to reduce this to a minute, I would say that you've got your data. Uh, it goes through an embedding process with something like an open AI or something from Hugging Face or Cohere, and that turns it into a series of floating point numbers. So if, essentially, you can vectorize anything with an embedding model. You want, you want to use the right embedding model for your data type, but you can vectorize a house, you can vectorize a bicycle, you can vectorize a car. And th in this way, you can, through a multidimensional analysis, you can find similarity easily. And similarity is pretty important when you're building out, for example, a sentence. Uh, what is the most, you know, a, a, a word most similar to a word that comes after this word? Et cetera, et cetera, and things like, I want to find a house that's similar to that house. Well, in what way? Well, there's a lot of ways, and there's so many ways that it can blow a human mind, and uh, vectors are definitely the way to go about doing all the similarity stuff. So now there's a, a bit of a debate, I guess I would say, going on out there, or is, which is uh, which goes like, is vector a database? A specialized database, or is it a feature of an existing database? And we'll we'll answer that argument as we go along here today. But the next data type I want to share with you is key value, key value stores, the uh, OLTP, if you will, of NoSQL. Real simple, just a key and a blob. That's it. It's an associative array data model, and you retrieve all data given a key. So it's fairly limited in terms of search. Um, I would say that a lot of the databases that went this way, like Redis uh, and, and Mem, Mem, excuse me, Memcached, Memcached D, uh, that they have evolved on uh, maybe quicker than some others into uh, the document category, which I'll share with you next. But key value still has a place. You can get thousands of transactions per second per CPU core. You can use indexes to look up the keys. React is, is another one. It uses Solar. For example, um, all data stores do a hash of the key to determine the location in the cluster. So it's really for any single object of unstructured data. So definitely still a good choice for a lot of things, like serving advertising content, which has to be fast, 
to web and, motel, web and mobile users. Content of this sort can be stored in key value using unique keys generated either by the application or the key value store. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of writes per second. So when you need that, uh, let's strip out the bells and whistles of the next category and go with key value. The next category, a very common category is document-oriented databases. And a lot of your favorite NoSQL databases started out their life just doing this. And that's your couch base. That's CouchDB, MarkLogic, MongoDB, yeah. RavenDB, Cloudin, which is now part of IBM, has been for a while. But anyway, this is a key value store plus, plus the values themselves are queryable. That's an extreme simplification. But there's multiple, uh, excuse me, materialized views and indexes. Documents can be addressed by URIs. It supports a REST interface. This is good for things like event logging, content management, real-time web serving, and e-commerce, and things like that, all kinds of semi-structured data. Um, what I do a lot when I'm recommending what database to use for what is I will look at the data type. And more times than not, the data type is driving the decision of the type of database. Or I should say, historically it has. Now we have multimodal. And so how does that change what I advise and what you should advise? Well, we'll get, we'll get into that. But uh, historically, the data type has really been a predominant thing in making that decision. Finally, you got your column stores like in Cassandra, uh, HBase, Hypertable. This is for large amounts of data, data that needs compression because it's turning the data into columns that are easily compressed, uh, also known as big table. Great for things like time series, which is like your weather data, location data, sensor data, things that are rapidly evolving around you. Operational simplicity here, uh, no single point of failure. So great stuff here. Column stores used it plenty for a lot of great things. But we're moving into a new era of database, the multi-model database. Here's my definition. It's a single integrated database that can store, manage, and query data in multiple models such as relational, good old relational, that's right, document, graph, key value, column, store, and ca cache. Now, it's the opposite of polyglot persistence. Uh, hopefully this is not the first time you've heard that term, but it may be one of the last if, uh, if this uh, new era plays out. And that's the use of multiple databases in a workload. And when I say a database can manage, can store, manage, and query data in these models, I don't mean there's some band-aids under the hood. You know what I mean? I don't mean under the hood, it is taking that document data and turning it into uh, column data so that it can query it in the way that it already, always has. Both parts, the storage and the query uh, engine have to be updated to be true multi-model. So accept no substitutes. Make sure you know how they're doing the multi-model. And I'll get to some criteria that you should be looking for a little bit later. So we mix and match databases all the time in an enterprise. We have to. We have had to, and we still will have to. As a matter of fact, you might be thinking, as I've said, right, this simplifies decisions. Yes, in, in a way it does, but in reality, it's made it harder because now you have so many more possibilities when you talk about multimodal, when suddenly the 10 databases at your disposal become multimodal. And I mean, that just explodes the possibilities. And so I used to say, actually, I say this because a client once said this to me when we were planning his environment and I was blowing his mind with, we could do this, we could do that. And uh, he said, well, William, it sounds like there's a thousand ways we could do this. And uh, I had to step back and say, yeah, there, there are. There are a thousand ways we can do this. Well, now I would, I guess I would say there's a hundred thousand ways we can do this. So good luck out there. Um, and I, I hope to uh, hope to frame this up for you so that you can get in the ballpark of good decisions here. 
And that's what that's where we want to be. Now, a little bit more on this polyglot persistence, right? Okay. This is multiple databases within the same project. This idea is dying. Uh, increased operational complexity and a lack of consistency, <clears throat> excuse me, across the multiple data stores. You can do all this, or you can use a single multimodal database. Now, the main store in this environment is still frequently a relational database management system. That's right. We haven't been able to get rid of relational databases. Uh, and that's been around for, gee, 30, 40 years now. So you could use a key value pair for fast and simple stuff like shopping cart and session data. You could use document oriented database or column for flexible schemas and modeling. You can use column stores for your time series data. And again, I've typically gone by the data type. Many applications have this need. This is not a niche need. This is not a, well, most of our applications just use one. Well, if that's true today, it won't be true tomorrow. It is actually, I, I actually see most applications going this way, which is why the vendors are going more multi-model. So polyglot persistence, it's the opposite of multi-model. Now I showed you the DB engines uh, statistics before and the top 10, well, here they are again. And I drilled in on each of them to see what DB engine said about which of the specific multi-model data types that these support. And here you go. And again, I might quibble, but it's the idea that we're getting after right now. They had the data. Oracle at the top, number one, we all know this, relational, document, time series, graph, RDF, spatial, and vector. Oh, nice big long list, right? MySQL, relational, document, time series, and spatial. And you can read on here and you can see, maybe, you, maybe your favorite database is on here. Maybe you didn't know that your favorite database at least alleges <laughs> that they support these all these data types that you need. So you might use Oracle just for relational, and you might use other data other other databases for your document, your time series, your graph, and your RDF. So I want to put a question in there for you. Do you need to be doing that? And I'm going to give you some some framework to think about that. Here's an example use of databases. Typical, typical within a large organization. Oracle for relational, among others. <laughs> MongoDB for your documents. Neo4j for graph. Pinecone for your vector. InfluxDB for your time series. Maybe a mark logic for your RDF data, if you still have that. But when it comes to spatial, not a lot of specialty databases. You, if you're on Oracle, you might be using the Oracle spatial uh, bundled capability there anyway. So I, I included that. So this, again, this might be for one application or it might be for your architectural standard. All the decision criteria applies to both as we go along here. Now, I might still use, even though I am a proponent of multi-model, and let's say that Oracle is our basis within our organization. It's our enterprise standards, what we use. Uh, I still might use MongoDB for documents if, the document data structure might change frequently. There are many complex hierarchies or nested structures. And there is a high, or there is a high volume of data inserts, updates, and queries on document fields with varying lengths or structures. Why? Because MongoDB does a better job at this stuff. Yes, it does. Now, this, this has to be, for me to complexify, if, if that's a word, uh, uh, to make my environment more complex with multiple databases, there has to be a reason. And these are those reasons. So it's a judgment call. Uh, I never in my presentations try to take away your judgment. Judgment is essential all along the way. I can just give you some, some knowledge, some framework, and then you have to apply it. So I might still use MongoDB or some other document database. I'm not picking on them necessarily. Might use them for documents if these are the conditions. I might use Neo4j for graph because it's fun and I like it, but that's not a good enough reason. I might use it for graph if your data has complex relationships, you need fast and efficient graph queries. All the things you're seeing on all these slides have to do with if you are doing deep 
analysis, deep capabilities within that data type. Because the specialty databases, if I may call them that, Neo4j is of itself a multi-model database. All right, we can go the other way with this, right? But if uh, you have these highly specialized needs around that data type, you still might consider these specialty databases. If graph is the dominant data type in the workload and, oh, you just have a little relational, and then, you know, you might lean into the Neo4j for that and go ahead and, and, and have an Oracle database as well. Uh, so again, judgment, is it the dominant data type in the workload? Now, I made, a, I made a huge point about this last month about vector. I might still use Pinecone for vector if vector is the dominant data type in the workload, but these are early days for the vec for vector databases for the especially for these specialty databases but even the ones like Oracle uh, Mongo uh, um, um, data stacks they they have made great or I should say similar strides across the board so I find a lot of uh parity if you will and I find a lot of uh, not necessarily nece not necessarily advantages with the specialty vector databases like Pinecone. No, uh, no, no shade on Pinecone here necessarily, um, but um, I have compared it to some others and uh, uh, some of the more generalized databases. I believe as time goes on, Pinecone and its ilk will separate in their capabilities with vector. And then we'll have a bigger decision to make about whether we are going with a specialty database there or not. So this is a work in progress around vector. I still might use InfluxDB for time series if it's high volume. If time series is the dominant data type, there you have that again. There you have that theme again. If you're writing at high volume and that's something that's relative to your organization, to your capabilities, to what you've done before. It is true that every organization should, should be defining large differently or uniquely to their, or their capabilities as an organization. And uh, if you're using downsampling. So that's the process of reducing the number of data points in a series while trying to preserve the essential information. So it's like a a uh, long winding road represented by a series of closely spaced data points. Downsampling would involve strategically removing some of those points to create a simpler representation. It's a feature of time series. And you can't get that in every generic multi-model implementation of time series. So for example, Oracle could perform downsampling of time series data but it's not as straightforward or efficient as using a dedicated time series database like InfluxDB. So there you go. You might use some of these specialty databases still, but I think the pendulum is swinging and I want you to consider simplifying your environment. So in reality, it's more complex now. So let's put it into action in some different industries. Let's start with retail because that's something that I like to start with because everybody can sort of graphs. Retailers have valuable customer data scattered across different systems, transaction systems, browsing, history, social media. This fragmented data hinders things like personalized recommendations, recommending products that truly match customer preferences. And that brings to mind another benefit of multi-model, which is all the data in one place. And you can more easily triage that data, reconcile that data across uh, the different places that it comes from. By analyzing all data points in one place, the retailer, for example, can gain a more complete understanding of customer behavior and preferences. This allows for hyper-personalized product recommendations across channels. This will increase customer satisfaction and loyalty and potentially get you higher conversion rates. What about manufacturing? An example for manufacturing would be around predictive maintenance and quality control, because these companies rely on sensor data containing real-time equipment information and good old maintenance records, which are mostly structured. And that's where your historical data is on repairs and replacements. So the data fragmentation makes it difficult to predict equipment failures and ensure product quality. 
by analyzing the sensor data alongside historical maintenance records, companies can identify the patterns that indicate potential equipment failures. And we've already talked about what some of the downsides are of multi-model. And these are some of the upsides. And finally, from healthcare, healthcare data scattered across different formats. Um, what an opportunity in healthcare. Uh, I say that about a lot of things because of the way that the data is scattered in, in healthcare, but definitely this is one of them. Healthcare data scattered uh, across structured fields, uh, structured data like medical records, unstructured data like genomic data and medical images like x-rays. All this fragmentation is hindering where medicine is going and we all know where it's going. It's going to personalized medicine. It's based on your DNA developing treatment plans tailored to a patient's unique medical history and genetic makeup. And it also will assist, multi-model that is, will assist drug discovery, identifying potential drug targets and expediting research for new medications. So by analyzing the comprehensive profile, doctors can get deeper insights into individual disease risks and treatment responses. We all want that. So multi-model has a role to play. So, William, you've told me all about multi-model uh, and these databases are claiming it and I want to simplify. So what do I look for? Well, it's, it's non-trivial to cover the features of an excellent implementation of any model, let alone multiple models, but some have done that. It's understandable if a platform has a first or an anchor model. Pretty much they all do. Look carefully though, look more carefully, I would say, at the implementation of the second and subsequent models to ensure compliance with the best practices of those models. Stuff like high compression, node failure recovery without service disruption, a cost-based optimizer, things like this. Make sure that those all apply to each model that you are considering using, using that database for. The ability to scale a multi-model solution from one to multiple is crucial since a multi-model database will typically be, be deployed with one model, most predominant at a time. And by the way, if you just want a database for one model and it, it gives you several, that doesn't matter. Just look at it on the face of it in terms of the ROI potential, the TCO potential of the database to the problem. A multi-model database should be able to join data across multiple models and otherwise access data from those models that have been determined to be the best fit of the data. So those, and for those cases where data is replicated in multiple models, which is usually model and data change propagation supports this notion of a single infrastructure that a multi-model database is utilizing. So if a database is changed in context of one of its model interfaces, those changes will propagate in the others. This supports frequent complicated and error prone, lack of error, that is, need to efficiently manage data schema evolution and the propagation of the changes to the various databases. So leveraging a multi-model database that can deal with structurally different data on a single database platform enables microservices to access a variety of different data types in each microservice. So consider that as well. Got one more slide here on what to look for. Globally distributed applications need a database that can distribute globally and transparently replicate the data anywhere to the center closest to its users. The requirements also tend to require multi-region deployments enabling deployment to secondary regions in addition to the primary. A multi-model database attempts to embrace the challenge of a cross-model optimizer by developing a unified query language to accommodate all the supported data models. Every query language needs an optimizer. A good multi-model optimizer will be more difficult to build than a single model optimizer. But data visualization vendors, for example, have overcome essentially the same problem, optimizing queries across databases. So it's a similar type of thing. So we got JSON flattening without data explosion, edge capable database, very important today, cross-model data processing, language and optimizer. That's probably the main one on this slide. 
universal indexes. These are indexes that span data in multiple models. It's a better solution. And these can be B plus trees, uh, G index for graph, et cetera. So what does all this mean to an enterprise? What does this increase possibilities? What does this mean to an enterprise? Simpler data management. I've, I've, I've hit on this many times. This is important. Simple scales. Not simple, complex doesn't scale because you're just wading through the uh, technical debt all the time. And it's hard to even think about getting over that mountain and doing something differently. I know this is how many enterprises work. You'd love to, an executive would love to say, let's do this or that project. But they know that that means that they got to figure out the data as well as 10 other things, right? But when it comes to figuring out the data, they know it's going to be challenging because every time it's challenging. And so, yeah, maybe I won't make that suggestion and move the company forward in that way because I would have that big mountain to climb. And I've only got so many uh, matches to burn here. And so I won't burn them here. Yeah, that's how it works. Not often do we get a chance to simplify. Here's a chance with multi-model databases, a unified platform that reduces silos and gives you a lot of flexibility, gives you enhanced scalability and performance. Simplicity scales, let me say that again. This is scale out, efficient storage and horizontal scaling out. Many multi-model databases are designed for horizontal scaling. This adds more servers to handle increasing data volumes and user requests. This can be crucial for enterprises with growing data needs. Yeah. And it also will give you improved data analysis. It's probably the second biggest benefit area beyond simplicity that these multi-model databases bring by cohab cohabitating the data and keeping it consistently up to date in the various data, mo data models under the hood. Wow, so much benefit to that. Unified queries deeper insights, data being all there. By bringing the various data types together, enterprises can gain a more holistic view of the operations and uncover hidden patterns or trends that might be missed with isolated databases. Other potential benefits, reducing costs, one vendor to pay, one vendor to deal with, and you're consolidating your data storage and management into a single platform. That can potentially lead to cost savings compared to managing multiple specialized databases. Faster development. The development is usually pretty homogenous across the different data types. You can almost layer off the fact that the data is of a different type and just deal with it in the way that you normally do. Now, if you're a vendor out there with a multi-model database, I think there's an opportunity to highlight the use of multi-model to gain workloads from model-specific vendors. We could do a TCO study showing how much less expensive it is by labor and license to do a typical enterprise workload that needs multiple models in yours versus multiple databases. I love to do these studies and bring that data to you. I haven't done that yet. This is all what I think right now. But I think the TCO is there for multi-model. And I hope to be bringing you some, some data at some point in the future. But I think this is a winner. In summary, enterprises have many data types to manage. Data types are database features. Now I answer that question. It's a database feature. Database vendors have been rapidly extending. This is not a niche. It's not going away. Uh, they are there. And you probably are unaware of all of the data types that you could be using a, one of your databases for. So the decision is both for single application and an architectural standard. There are still times to use specialized databases. And I gave you some, usually it's when the dominant data type in a workload is a specialized data type. A chosen multi-model database should excel in various data models. And I gave you some criteria for that. Single copy of data, handle multiple changes across models and utilize universal indexes. Multi-model means simpler data management, enhanced scalability and performance, and improved data analysis for enterprises. All things we want. We haven't often got this chance to simplify. As a matter of fact, 
I would say 11 of the 12 present presentations that I'm giving this year are not about simplification. They're about making your life more complex, but driving your business forward. And this is also about driving the business forward, but also using this unique opportunity to simplify. So using multi-model databases does this. And finally, polyglot persistence is almost dead. And that brings me to the end of the formal presentation. Back to you, Mark, to see if we have any questions. Yeah, we've got some really cool threads in chat and uh, and, and a really good question in, in Q&A uh, that's exciting. But um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with uh, something that popped up in chat first, because we talked a bit about vectors today and uh, vector embeddings are interesting and nearest neighbor algorithms are interesting. And uh, uh, somebody in chat said, do semantic graph databases and vector embeddings make for more efficient use of LLMs, avoiding hallucinations, give truthful guardrails to accuracy, that sort of thing? Um, to my knowledge, semantic graph hasn't caught up with that yet. Um, I did say last month, though, that I thought these two industries, if you want to call them that, graph and vector would eventually come together because I definitely see that potential. Mm -hmm. So I guess watch this space for that. Yeah, it, it is one of those fun things to think about, hey? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, should data modelers know how to develop models for all of these database types at various levels, conceptual, logical, physical, uh, so their designs can be used to build and implement the physical databases? It seems to me that the brave new world is passing by our traditional data modelers, the questioner says. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, for some reason, it seems like enterprises have been um, way too quickly, I would say, trying to chase out data modeling within their organization because they've been given all these uh, silver bullets uh, to try to uh, like these package models and so forth to try to avoid data modeling. And, and also just the mere fact that you can load it, just load the data and it'll figure out what, what, what's there uh, means you don't have to do traditional data modeling, right? Well, I think traditional data modeling is still pretty important. Um, maybe I'm old school, but, uh, I definitely do. But I think, uh, as if I'm, cons if I'm counseling on an individual basis in terms of career development, that sort of thing, and you want to be a data modeler today, yeah, you have to be able to model in more than just relational, uh, to be, to be very useful, uh, within an organization today. So all the models that I talked about, yes, you should be aware of that's expected. The, that foundation has come up to that point for any data model modeler I would hire or any of my clients probably would hire because they're all in the same boat of they don't have enough data modelers and they don't want to hire a bunch of them and they have all these data types. And why can't one person do multiple of these? And by the way, when you can do multiple, you have more, more control over the, the environment and the situation. You can, you know, uh, put in more of uh, more great standards across the board. So that is kind of where that stands. I totally agree with that. Actually, um, what I find interesting when thinking about that is um, I think data modelers are probably more required than ever before. If you've got a conceptual and logical model, you want somebody to understand both of those things before they can do anything that's like schema on read. So if you've got a NoSQL database and you're trying to make sense of the data in it, what are you doing if you don't have like a, at least a logical model to back up how you're pulling stuff out? And in, in my view, anyway. That's right. And, and, and I know that, um, I mean, the, where I'm, where I'm sending people to learn about data modeling, it's data diversity because data diversity is all over that topic and, and still very much uh, aligned with it. Um, what tools are able to create other model types? So able to create other model types. Okay. Um, applications within an enterprise create the data. I, I don't believe in my, in my years of experience that an application has ever come to me and said, William, what, what type of data should we create? It's always, we are creating this data. We need a database for it. <laughs> and I think that, you know, applications come in all flavors uh, all sizes for all purposes. And within an enterprise, all the data types I talked about today are being generated 
by those applications. So it's not necessarily like you buy a tool to specifically create that data. You build a tool, build or buy, a lot of ERPs, right? You build or buy tools to run businesses and it spawns this, it spawns this data. And we as data professionals, we deal with it. That's how I look at it. Awesome. Um, we, we've got a couple other uh, questions coming up from, from our discussion and answers here. Um, uh, I think this is more of a comment, but uh, you should produce a good logical model for the data regardless. The physical modeler is using the logical model to guide the development of the physical target. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I still believe in conceptual, logical, physical. So many people skip the conceptual and, and skip the logical. Please don't do that. Uh, uh, these are great documentation points and things to refer back to. So even in a even in a NoSQL situation, you might say, well, you don't have to do a model for that. I still say, I want to know what the different profiles of data are that are coming in uh, to this model. And by the way, in, in my experience, 90% of the data is of a single data type anyway. So let me learn about that. And, and that does that does involve modeling. So uh, I think most organizations are open and willing to uh, have the process of, 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 of data architecture be, be, be done in a logical way. And, but it's up to us. It's, we have to bring that process to the organization. And I think that logical, or excuse me, conceptual, logical, physical is still uh, the way to go with all your models. And uh, yes, you base one off the other, right? In that logical sequence. So bring that bring that methodology to your organization and that'll be a winner. We've got a, a couple of questions uh, coming up talking about tools out in the, out in the world. So, um... I think this is distilled best by our, our recent asker here. Uh, what are what are the best modeling tools in your mind for multimodal or multimodal? Hmm. I mean, I I still use Erwin. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I don't do a lot of the modeling myself anymore, which is unfortunate because I I, I certainly enjoy doing that, and I have lots of I have dozens of models in production all over the world. So I did enjoy it quite a bit. Um, any more though, when it comes to modeling beyond relational, I don't think there's a lot of good tools out there for that. Uh, we use Excel. We use Excel and just create the different uh, data profiles that are in there. And then we, we try to reduce it to something that looks looks almost relational, even though it's not. And then we bring it back into a relational modeling tool. And so, yeah, not great, but that's sort of the market right now. Yeah, that, I've been there too. <laughs> so I understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, do you guys uh, at Dataversity, do you have any, do you have any vendor days on, on um, modeling tools anymore? We did. We, oh, when was our last one? I think our last one was in April. I'll have to look at the calendar and we'll, we'll post it on our site, but yeah, uh, I think that person we, we do a day to day every, uh, a demo day every month. Um, uh, next month, I believe is data quality, uh, but I'll have to double check uh, the calendar because I don't have that up right now. And I'm sure I'm going to misstate something, <laughs> but yeah, that is one of the the popular things that, that pops up for sure is data modeling. Um, any other questions from chat or, or in the Q and a, if not, then thank you very much, William, for this wonderful presentation today. And, uh, just a reminder that we'll have, uh, copies of the recording out and slides within just a couple of business days. Great. Bye-bye all. Uh, thanks everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day.